On Friday, I was reading this article on The Guardian. I don't know if uh, some of you might have read it. Uh, about the, this uh, nuclear scientist, or actually it was not a nuclear scientist, it was just a scientist, who sent in a, um, what do you call it, a, a submission to a conference about nuclear science, completely made up of autocomplete function of the iOS um, mobile phone system. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a abstract of complete gibberish called atomic energy will have been made available to a single source. Uh, and it was accepted. And I think that really reveals something about the crisis that we, we see in modern science, that in spite of the fact that modern science has come a great, uh, 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 traveled far, and we are capable of things that no human being would have imagined even a few decades ago. Um, nevertheless, there is a deep crisis in, in modern science. And it also reveals that the role of philosophy in, uh, in, in science and in society is far from exhausted. Um, for centuries, um, the development of modern science put mysticism and idealism and obscure ideas on a back footing. Modern science was kind of the, the main weapon to fight against idealist thoughts uh, 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 and religion. But today, these kind of ideas are finding their ways back, um, are finding their way back, supported by the capitalist system and the, and the, and the capitalist class, which is in senile decay. Now, the bourgeoisie initially came to power on a wave of radical materialism, but today they've fall, they're falling into the most con conservative <laughs> idealism to justify their rule uh, and their grip over society. We have ideas such as postmodernism and neo-Kantianism, which are arguing that nothing really matters, uh, everything is completely subjective, and your most basic primitive desires are the measure to, to judge society uh, and, and, and nature. Um, history is a pile of random events, and class society is a, uh, class struggle is a childish mirage. And philosophy itself has been, the field of philosophy itself has been swamped with obscure ideas, um, uh, which have no relationship to, uh, to, 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 to the real world. And of course, the idea that all ideas are valid is very interesting as long as you don't apply it to anything concrete, as long as you don't apply it to anything in the real world. It it's can be a, an interesting thought experiment. But as soon as you want to actually achieve something by it and, and affect the world that we're living in, it's completely um, useless. Now, this is not how philosophy came to be. And that's, why, that's what I'm trying to focus this lead off about. Um, all men, all human beings have a philosophy, whether they have it consciously or a, an unconscious one, which is the reflection of the, of the philosophy of the ruling class within society. And in fact, Engels went so far as to say that dialectical thought is one of the main traits which, which distinguishes hum, human beings from animals. And by dialectical thought, it means the ability to be able to take an object or a phenomena and strip, a, strip away all the accidental peculiarities and see the real essence, the, the universal, the general aspect of it, and put that to, the, to, to a use. So, uh, um, yes, and this is an ability which, which allows human beings to dominate and manipulate nature far beyond our immediate reach. And that's the strength of, 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 of human beings. Now, the beginnings of, of real philosophy, uh, of the field of philosophy, came about with the development of productive forces, which at a certain stage led to the development of, uh, of, uh, of class society, and agricultural society, and slave society. Um, now, for the first time, a tiny, a, tiny, uh, a, a small uh, part of the human, human population could actually stop working uh, and dedicate their lives to speculation, to thinking, to inventing, to, de to developing uh, ideas and, and, uh, and culture and art. In, uh, in Greece, for instance, in ancient Athens, 
in the period we're talking about, which is about 700 to 300 BC, you had the population of 300,000, of which only 80,000 were, were Athenian, Athenian uh, uh, citizens. And of those, a minority, again, were aristocrats and basically the ruling class, uh, which, which meant that this, this minority was leaning on, uh, on, the, um, uh, productive, uh, on the labor of hundreds of thousands of people who were dispossessed one way or another. Um, and this is a similar thing we saw in many, many of the ancient civilizations in, in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, and in the Indus Valley, where you saw, along with the rise of class society, also the rise of philosophy and, 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 um, and speculative thought, you can say. But the first steps of these, the first signs of this, this type of thinking was always in the form of, uh, was always mixed with myth. So we had the development of, uh, of religions and mythical stories trying to explain uh, 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 nature and, and, the, and the laws of nature. In, in ancient Greece, the same was the, was the case. In the Homeric uh, uh, um, myths and also in the works of Hesiod, you find lots of interesting points uh, and interesting ideas trying to find the general laws which rule our, our universe and the society that, that we live in. But nevertheless, these were always mixed up with some type of religious and mythical thinking. Um, but the first philosophers in Greece, what made them stand out from all other layers and from all other uh, such uh, groups in society was that they decided to, to explain nature without the use of religion, explain nature by nature itself. And the first of these were the, were the Milesian schools, which was based in a, in a um, city-state called Miletius. Um, and these were the philosophers called Thales, Anaximanda, and Anaxagoras. Now, we don't know much about Thales, uh, except that, that he existed. He was apparently a, uh, <laughs> he lived, yes. And uh, he was apparently an engineer. And he, he also did work with geometry. And he could possibly have been involved in some kind of a, a, a shipping or a sailing and so on. Um, but what, what Thales began by asserting was trying, uh, uh, what all these, uh, these uh, group of philosophers tried to do was to find one element, one, uh, how do you say, one element which could, this, uh, was the building block of the universe, one principle, which was the main principle of the universe. And this is not, again, not, not an not a idea, idealist uh, principle as, as a great idea or such, but uh, a materialist one. And for Thales, this was water. And this might seem very primitive to us, but in fact, it was a huge step forward as no one else has tried to explain nature by nature as Thales was, was beginning to. And also, water is, in fact, a very uh, important element uh, in, 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 in the, on our planet, which for the most part consists of water. Um, for the Greeks, of course, for whom water was a lifeline, that this was the, the, the um, sea trade was their, uh, was the basis of, of their civilization. And also in everything living and everything, uh, uh, yes, well, in everything living, water is a, a key element. Um, now, following him, Anaximander put forward the idea that it wasn't water, but the infinite, this infinite material um, from which everything come to, come to be and to which everything uh, come to pass. And this was, again, another step forward from Thales, because Anax Anaxagoras was trying to define a general, universal, basically, word for matter, you, you, you can say. And again, this was another step forward, uh, that he developed this general concept of matter. And again, following them was Anaximander, which again took the whole uh, school one further step forward by by saying that the, the main element was this thing called air, or mist. Um, uh, and it wasn't as, as the air that we explain it today, but some kind of concrete element of which nature is composed. And it's the condensation and the rarefication of this element, the 
how to say the qual qualitative uh, pressure and depressurizing of this element, which which then forms all the elements that we know. And uh, one of the 20th century philosophers actually said, well, if he was talking about um, hydrogen, he wouldn't have been too far off the off the mark. Of course, the, this is all speculation, but it reveals the the Im immense steps forward that these people were, were taking and the extremely advanced uh, conclusions they were coming to based merely on speculation without any of the advanced tools and, 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 and knowledge, accumulated knowledge that we have uh, today. Now, parallel to these, you had the development of a school of uh, Pythagoreans. Uh, probably everyone here knows Pythagoras and some of his equations from, uh, from school. The, the Pythagoreans were, was like a kind of a cult, really a semi-cult and semi-philosophical uh, brotherhood. And what they thought was that uh, everything is numbers, basically. Everything can be quantified, ergo everything is in, in numbers. And they found these magical numbers, one, two, three, four. Uh, they, were, they were very powerful numbers because put together they would make ten and they had all these weird and wonderful uh, ways of explaining the magical forces of numbers, which were the building blocks of, of, of all that we see, all of nature and society. And in fact, it's not, it's not too far off from many of the semi-mystical mathematical uh, uh, conclusions that mathematicians come to uh, this century, which is actually a regression. And although we can forgive the Pythagoreans from living in such a simple and backward society, we can't forgive the modern day math mathematicians for making these, these same uh, mistakes. But the point of the Pythagoreans was that for the first time, in a clearly, it, it was clearly, they clearly tried to expose a world view based on ideas. So basically the Pythagoreans brought forward the, the birth of idealism as we know it, because uh, in reality, obviously, there is no such thing as numbers. Numbers is a, a how do you say, a, a, a way that we try to generalize quantitative measuring of nature. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a, obviously a very powerful tool, but it doesn't exist outside of nature. It's merely a approximation, a generalization of our view uh, of nature. But for them, they turn this idea that human beings have come, come to into the reality itself. So they made the idea dominate society and society and nature being a reflection merely of, of, of this idea. Um, although it should also be said that besides uh, the, the birth of uh, idealism, they also did provide, you know, they did give lots of uh, very important, um, they brought forward lots of very important new ideas, especially in the field of mathematics, of course, but also in a quantitative view of viewing the world, of, of the, the, the relationship between quantity and quality in nature and society. Um, again, slightly after these, from, from 535 until 475 BC, uh, we had a philosopher called Heraclitus, whom we know actually very little about because very little has, has uh, remained we know about his ideas from other philosophers and from a few fragments which have, which have uh, come down to us. So I think in total there's about 130 um, statements that he made. But uh, Heraclitus, who, was, who wrote in a very poetical manner, and he was actually called the dark and the obscure by his contemporaries, had some extremely profound ideas uh, which all, uh, um, how do you say, which all uh, were about change and motion and the fact that that's the main principle in nature, that nature is in a constant flux of changing, coming into being and going out of being. Um, and even more, probably more fundamental to his ideas were the fact that um, contradictions are an inherent part of nature. And in fact, without contradictions, there wouldn't be any movement and there wouldn't be any, uh, any nature. In fact, he says, um, of the uh, Eleatics who tried to prove that there was no contradictions. He says, well, they're trying to, in fact, they're trying to destroy the world. They're trying to destroy the universe. Um, 
you might know him because he said things such as you never step into the same river twice I think that's, that's the most famous of his of his ideas uh, but also one of the ones I found most interesting is is the, the question he says there is harmony in strife like the uh, what is that it's like the bow and the lyre so that's how he explains nature of the harmony of coming together of opposite tendencies propelling movement and development and change forward um, and he was also a monist so he, he, he uh, as opposed to the dualist view of, of, of nature that, uh, that the Pythagoreans had i.e. that there's one world of ideas and then there's one real world uh, uh, Heraclitus was a monist saying there's only one principle uh, and that was for him fire now that's not the same fire as the elements, the very primitive notion of fire, I think what he really meant was the uh, was energy. In fact, was the um, consuming and the changing, constantly changing nature of uh, of matter through uh, uh, which is completely connected with energy. Um, now, in contrast to Heraclitus, you have the Eleatic school, which was uh, by Xenophanes. Uh, Paramenides and Zeno, those are the main uh, teachers of that school. Now they try to contrast Heraclitus by saying, well, if you want to have movement, if you want to have change, that means you, ha you, have, to, you have to go from being to not being. Things go from being something to not being something else. And in fact, they can both be and not be at the same time. But they say, no, no, no. not being does not exist. Not being cannot exist. Therefore, they can only be. We can only have one whole unity of being which is never changing and never developing. Uh, now that sounds like a very, very nice idea, a very consistent philosophy, but of, of course it had no relationship whatsoever again to the reality that, that, that we live in. Um, nevertheless, they, they did make some very, very uh, profound, uh, uh, they had very profound uh, ideas and probably the most significant one of them, Zeno, brought the, this philosophy and this school to its logical conclusion, which is dialectically its opposite. Because he actually put this into practice by having these paradoxes of Zeno, which you might know of, have learned in school by saying, uh, you know, you can never reach, if you shoot an arrow and it halves the distance towards its aim every time, constantly, it will never reach its, its goal. It will, it will never reach the, the end of the room. And the other one, which is also very famous, is Achilles uh, and the turtle, I think. And there's a, obviously Achilles is running much faster than the turtle, but every time the turtle moves one meter, the Achilles moves 100, and then, and so on and so on, and they will never ever reach, and Achilles will never overtake the turtle. Now, this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, concrete example of the idea uh, that not being ca cannot be, because the only way to solve this paradox is in fact not by putting up uh, time and space into individual points that you can stop and say this is where the arrow is at, because you can never do that. In fact, any time you try to pinpoint any, any, uh, anything and saying this is where this specific uh, um, element is at the moment, it has already passed it. Everything is in constant change. And that goes down to the to infinite depth, you, you, you can say. And things move by being, in fact, one place and another, by being and not being at the same time. And that is the whole basis of change. So Zeno, by driving this form of idea to its logical conclusion, in fact, came to the opposite conclusion, that dialectics, the unity of opposites and constant change, is, in fact, the mode of existence of our universe <coughs> and of nature. Now, following uh, these, um, there was another school, the Atomists, who were preceded by a philosopher called Anaxagoras. And what these guys did was basically uh, pulling together all the progressive elements within the schools of the Pythagoreans, the Iliadics, uh, the early naturalists, materialists, the, the, the Milesians, and the Milesians, and, and Heraclitus, basically a synthesis of all previous philosophy. Uh, 
Now, Anaxagoras was a, 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 an incredible uh, philosopher. He, first of all, was the first person to assert that the sun was one giant mold, uh, uh, burning uh, element, and that the stars were similar to the sun, only that they were further away. Uh, he also explained that the, what we see, the light on the moon, is actually a reflection of, uh, of, of, of the light coming from the sun. And he made many, many uh, incredible astronomical discoveries, which, was, which were then forgotten for thousands of years and only rediscovered recently. Um, but the main thing, the main point of his philosophy was that everything is infinitely divisible and matter of made of, a, uh, of particles, an infinite variety of particles, uh, which, which form, which, how do you say, um, organizes itself in certain ways uh, and becomes the world that we see today. Now, this created the bridge to the, to the first atomists, which was uh, a guy called Lucipus, which, which we don't know much about, and Democritus, who was his, uh, his pupil, who took this idea of the particles and said that, well, the universe actually exists of two things. One is atoms, is, uh, uh, which means undiv undivisible of, of these particles, uh, which he called atoms, and then the void, which is a absolute vacuum, which is nothing, which is basically atoms are the only thing which remains in the end. And it's the uh, interaction of atoms, now this is the general idea of the school, although it developed throughout time, but what they say that is that it's the ever-changing interaction of these atoms coming together and going away, which uh, forms the basis of the world that we, as we know it today. And obviously, that was a, an amazing anticipation of uh, what of the discoveries of modern science. It makes it, you know, considering the extremely low level of the productive forces and the tools and the and the, and the science at the disposal of these people, it's uh, it's incredible that they that they get to these conclusions. They said that eternity, the matter is infinite, and so is time, and it's in a state of uh, infinite continuous change coming together and uh, coming to being and going out of being in different, uh, uh, in different organizations uh, or different formations. Um, they, also, they also said that nothing can be, be created. So matter cannot be created or destroyed, and neither can energy. Again, things which are relatively new to modern science, only 100 or 100, <coughs> well, about 100 years old. Uh, and even then, we still have scientists actually who, 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 who doubt these things and who, um, who, who say that that's not the case. Um, we'll get to that later on. Um, they also said that the universe is infinite and so is time. There's no origin, no beginning of time, and, and, and no end. Now, if we compare it to today, I think it, it really reveals the strength of systematic philosophical thought, of a conscious philosophical approach, uh, and a conscious approach to method in, in, uh, in modern science, and what the lack of it, uh, uh, what, the, what the lack of such an approach can lead to, because today we have the ideas which basically say that time just came to being 20 million years ago, and you know, so did all matter, so did all the, the whole universe. Um, <coughs> and um, Obviously, the, the main question is then, what was there before then? And there's no, que there's no answer to that. But if they had a philosophical approach, approach a, a, a materialist method, uh, they would probably much easier uh, get around these questions. <coughs> now, at the same time, you had, well, Greece at this time was a, a, a society in extreme flux of wars, revolutions, counter-revolution, crisis, decay, and this is a time where, obviously, this is a, this is a, a time where ideas, uh, new ideas come to the fore uh, and reflect themselves in different ways. I think also this is one of the reasons, the differences between Greece and similar societies in Egypt and in the Indus Valley, for instance, which were far more stable and therefore had a different uh, uh, philosophy coming out of them. But in this situation, you had the rise of a group of people called the Sophists, who were a, a group of people, I think the most well-known of them are Protagoras and Gorgias, who were people who, who would travel around to different cities and teach for a living, professional teachers. They would teach rhetoric or morals, 
um, and, other, uh, and other things. They were basically professional educators for hire. But they were also ret rhetoricians. Is that how you say it? Rhetoricians? Rhetoricians uh, uh, for hire. Uh, they would be hired in the, uh, in the um, political discussions to put forward certain views of, of, of certain layers in society. And their overall world view was, uh, could be described as doubt everything. Right? And, and also, uh, what Protagoras, who was the, probably the, the most significant one of them, who said that man is the measure of all things. And now within this, there, is, there are the two sides to this, because on the one hand, you have this extreme relativism, extreme subjectivism, that if you pursue it on a, a, from a rigorous philosophical basis, it will lead to solipsism. It would mean that, well, you can't prove anything. You can't move out of this world. You can only prove that you exist. You can't even prove that you exist, really. You can only prove that you're thinking things and you basically your thoughts have created the whole world around you. That's the extreme uh, conclusion that solipsism leads to. But in this society, I think also the, the, the sophists, they had a revolutionary element to them and a very progressive one, which was the denunciation of all the, um, the how do you say, um, <clears throat> the formal veneer of civilization uh, when everything was falling apart the aristocracy was, was, was drowning itself in all kinds of degenerate uh, 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 um, uh, actions. And they, the sophists spoke the truth on the one hand, explained what was, uh, that there is no morals, that as you can see, every man in uh, Athens do, does what he, what he wants to. Uh, and at the same time, uh, to, to challenge every notion, all the pre-existing uh, uh, notions that, that, that came up, that, that existed, um, which could then later on be questioned and put under a more methodic um, uh, development, I would say, um, investigation by other philosophers. That was the role that they played. Uh, and I would also say that this also makes them completely different to, the, to their, how do you say, sisters and brothers today, which is the uh, postmodernist, the neo Kantian, is all these things that we see today, which is an extremely conservative thing. In fact, they don't challenge any existing idea. If you, if you view you know, uh, modern postmodernism, is mostly about challenging sexuality and, well, which, are, which can be interesting, but which doesn't change anything of the fundamental basis of, of society and doesn't change anything and doesn't challenge the fundamental ideas which are put forward by the ruling class. But that's not how, how the first uh, sophists uh, reacted. They put everything to, uh, under criticism. And they were a reaction, in fact, to the dissolution of the old society. Now, another reaction to the, to the dissolution of old society came from Socrates and Plato, who, uh, who, who lived between uh, 469 and 348 BC. Now, um, they lived in an extreme period of extreme instability. There, were, there was a revolution, a counter-revolution. Um, uh, there was a war, 30-year war with Sparta. And the whole of the Athenian aristocratic degeneration was visible for them to see. Um, and also, all of this was followed by the rule of the 30 tyrants, uh, which was imposed on Athens by, by Sparta. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of the ideas that, that Socrates and Plato tried to portray, of course, we don't know much about, about uh, Socrates, um, came from, uh, from, I think, a criticism uh, or a reaction towards this society, and I'll explain why. Now, so, uh, Socrates didn't write anything himself. He was against writing because he said, if you, if you write something, you write, or if you say something, you say it in a specific context, and you can never recreate that context in writing. Ergo, you can't, you should never write anything. Um, but other people have written about it, and, and more specifically, Plato uses Socrates as his main hero throughout his works, and really raises the work of Socrates and um, in a thorough scientific manner, and uh, it creates an exposition of it. Now, the, the, the main thing that Socrates did if you read the Socratic dialogues, was what? First of all, he would sit around in the agora, in the marketplace, and he would go discuss with people. First of all, 
this indicates the level of the economic uh, situation that a certain class of people could afford to do this, could actually not do anything than just think. Um, but, but, but his method was uh, extremely important in that he would go to different people and he would ask him simple question. What is the good? What is virtue? Like, uh, one of the main, main uh, things that he deals with is a virtue uh, that as in excellence, how a human being should act, how a human being should lead his life to, f to, to fully fulfill it and to be in full harmony um, with the you know, uh, the, with the ideas, uh, well, basically with society and, and nature. And, but he would ask, what is the good? And people would then answer him. And then he would go through a series of questions and answers, trying to uncover uh, the, the different um, contradictions within this concept. And in the end, trying to get to the, to the essence, the universal of the good, uh, which in the end for him was uh, philosophical thought. Um, Yes. Now, <clears throat> that's the, the classical dialectical uh, form of discussion where you present a thesis and then there is an antithesis presented to that. And from the clash of these, you have in the end a synthesis that even, even if you don't reach an agreement, you go out with a far deeper understanding of what both uh, parties uh, uh, initially started with. And and Socrates saw it, this it, as, his, as his main task in life, to make conscious the unconscious uh, ideas which are in, in men. And in, in that respect, it's not much different than Marxists, the way that we work towards the working class and as revolutionaries, is to make conscious the dormant, inherently inherent interests and, and ideas of, of the working class. And Socrates, Socrates saw himself as as a midwife of ideas. He tried to make people conscious. He tried to make people think. Um, and, the, and, and the most, uh, how do you say, the best way to do this was try to make them realize the inner essence and the universal and general, most general aspects of any, of any given uh, phenomenon, um, which is, yes, which is the method of induction um, and which is which has later become a, a very important part of uh, of science. Now, this was in effect um, the the birth of logic of, of philosophical logic as we know it. And Plato, what he does first of all, he canonizes this. He puts this obviously he, he makes an exposi exposition of this. But he goes a bit further because Plato he, he develops the idea that. Um, there are all these ideas, all these general, sorry, all these general uh, essences of things, such as a table or a circle. These things we can we can discuss, and we will never find a perfect circle or a perfect table, but we can get to the idea that there is such a thing as a table. This is how we would define a table or a dog or a human being or, or, or anything. And he said, well, in fact, the whole world that we see today is a is merely a a bad copy of the real world, which is these universal ideas. And, if, and that is the, the task of the philosopher, is get to see the real world, to understand what the real world is about, and, um, and, uh, un, and bring, it, bring it to society. Um, and this is the theory of the forms that he developed, that in the reality, in fact, all of this that we see today is non-existent, it's not real. It's just a bad imitation, and the real world is in the, in the world of ideas and forms, which he called them. <coughs> um, now, this is obviously reality stood on its head, because as much as we can generalize, those generalizations are still within our minds. And obviously, they're very, very powerful. They tell, they tell us a lot about any given phenomenon. But nevertheless, they cannot exist Outside of outside of the world that uh, that that we that we are investigating, um, and also I think the main thing is that what he was reflecting was the mindset of this extremely wealthy uh, ruling aristocracy, this extremely wealthy layer of people who never really participated in any kind of practical work, and at the same time in this in this time of extreme crisis, where they actually wanted to find 
a way outside of the world. Everything that we saw is, is incomplete. Uh, Plato saw Athens as completely degenerate. Uh, you couldn't, you know, it wasn't logical. People weren't following reason. They were doing, like Athenians started a new war when they were winning over uh, Sparta. Uh, that's insane, that's, that's stupid. They killed uh, Socrates in, in, in 399 BC, the, the, the wisest Athenian. And, it, and all of Plato's work is in fact kind of a condemnation of this decaying society and trying to find, say, well, in fact, the real world, the world that's worth living for is not in this world, it's somewhere else. And that's what we, we, we need to, to strive for. And in the Republic, he created such a, uh, a, a, a world in his thoughts, you can say, with the philosopher king who's supposed to rule, uh, rule society. And society is supposed to work only for the philosopher king, who was the only person who actually knew the real world. Um, uh, obviously, <clears throat> what he couldn't explain was how could this real uh, world of forms and ideas, how could this have any kind of connection with the reality that we see today? That, is, that has always been the problem for idealists and especially dualists, that how can you unite these two worlds of ideas and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, matter? In spite of this, I would say that Plato was an incredible thinker. And one of the things, one of the main lessons from Plato, although there are many, is that he was an extremely consistent person. And he was, uh, he despised eclecticism. The first thing that you see in a uh, uh, Platonic, or sorry, a so Socratic uh, dialogue is that Socrates takes out and reveals all the contradictions of the statements that, that the opposite side has to say. So, well, if you say this here, well, what would you do in this situation? And that's very uh, significant for Plato that throughout his work is the extreme amount of uh, consistency and being true to finding the truth as opposed to having a fixed idea that you try to uh, impose and, and find out. That he, he built his method and literally built the whole world uh, fr fr from that method and took it to its logical conclusion, uh, which is something that, that, again, modern philosophy could learn a lot from being extremely eclectic and using one method, one argument in one place, which they possibly could not uh, in another. For instance, we have these uh, graphs over the economy which says, well, this year we have one dollar, next year we have two, so obviously third year we would have three. On the one hand, putting a very rigid schematic outline of the development of the economy, and on the other hand, they place immense amount of um, um, uh, emphasis on the dynamic effects of having of stimulating the economy, which are completely coming out of nowhere and having no basis in in reality at all. Um, yes, but nevertheless, Platonic thought uh, developed idealism to the fullest and became, in fact, the core basis of idealism and and, and especially the Christian religion. Uh, over the next uh, 2,000 uh, years. Now, after Plato, we have Aristotle, which who was the uh, pupil of Plato uh, for 20 years. Um, and Aristotle lived from 384 to 322. And he was, he in fact did, wasn't Greek originally. He was from, he wasn't from the Greek city-states. He was a Macedonian. His father worked as a physician for the Macedonian court. And his whole approach to philosophy and science was far more um, uh, materialist. <clears throat> in fact, he, he loved experiments, he loved observing nature as it is, and that's where he thought that, that n real knowledge comes from. That knowledge is, uh, first of all, uh, observing via sense perception. So he, he, he thought this is the real world that we can sense, but obviously he wasn't he wasn't satisfied with that only because he said, obviously, then you have to process and analyze what you see and draw out ge uh, and generalize it and draw out the main lessons. Um, he was an extremely encyclopedic mind. He wrote about uh, logic, rhetoric, politics, economy, biology, geography. I mean, there's probably all the major sciences were somehow either founded or at least for the first time laid out and, and treated in a systematic way by, uh, by, um, um, by Aristotle. <clears throat> in fact, you can say he's, he's the founder of modern science in, in many ways. Um, 
But he, he broke sharply with Plato, exactly, because he said, how can you explain this idea, this perfect, unchanging, unmoving, ideal world uh, leads to this ext to extremely, extreme world in extreme flux and change. So that's, that's nonsense. That c you cannot explain that. And therefore, um, he set out the idea that, that the world as it is, that is what exists, and that's what we have to get our uh, ideas from, and that's what we have to look at and analyze. Um, yes. Um, sorry. So, one of the things that Aristotle is, is, uh, is known for is that he put down the basis for formal logics, which is still the, ba the, the, the basis for the formal logic which, which is being taught in many universities today, uh, which is essentially the idea of uh, that A is equals A. That is the, the main underlying idea in his logics, is that when you have a statement, when you, when you try to discuss or analyze something, looking at it, that is that. This bottle is a bottle. A is equal A. But, and that is obviously a very powerful thing when you try to systematically analyze things, categorize things, and uh, get an initial understanding of a certain phenomenon. But as soon as you try to go a bit deeper and a bit closer to that phenomenon, obviously A is not equals A. No two A's are alike if you go really close mm -hmm. and look at it. No two bottles of water are, are, ex are exactly the like. Not only are they not alike, but they're constantly changing and they're moving even further away or closer towards being alike and then further away again. There's a, there's a constant change and flux in society. And so therefore this idea of, of A is, is equal A cannot really explain uh, the, a, a deep, give us a deep understanding of the complex processes of the world. Although in real life, in normal daily day life, it is actually an important thing to know that when I'm taking five pounds out of my pocket to pay something, it's actually five pounds. And no one's going to see how is it fluctuate, how is the pound fluctuating in the world markets in this, in this tiny second, and how is this pi pound, five pound note degrading? That wouldn't make as much sense, would it? So obviously it's a powerful thing, but it has its limitations. Unfortunately, and, and I would say that Aristotle realized this. Aristotle did discuss change and matter coming into being, going out of being. Um, in fact, he saw it as a uh, very essential element in, in matter to be in constant motion. Uh, but he saw this as two ways of, think, of looking at, uh, at, at things, um, and two ways of, of, of looking at the world, which you could use in different uh, circumstances. Um, yes. Yes. Although I would say also that there is some inconsistencies in Aristotle because although he had a very scientific um, method of dealing with, with, uh, with things, in some points he was uh, very inconsistent and moved towards some kind of idealism. So for instance, he says on the one hand, he says time is infinite, space is infinite. But at the same time he says, well, all movement, if you, go, if you trace them back, further and further and further and further back, you find this unmoved mover which gave the first uh, move to, to the universe and then everything started moving. And obviously this leads straight back to the ideas that Plato was, uh, was bringing about. Whereas you know, if, this is, if this unmoved mover exists, if this thing which is not, unlike, not like anything else in nature exists, then who, first of all, who caused it and how does it interact with, 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 the, with, with the rest of uh, nature? Uh, which, is, which cannot be explained. But, and he had other things such as uh, the question of the soul. Uh, for instance, he said that, well, all living beings have a, have a soul. And for him, soul was not a soul as we would know it. It was a vitalized, a vital, uh, how to say, a vital force. Basically, the coming together of the whole of the body, using up energy and uh, releasing it again. Uh, in an in a organic way as we know it, that's what he called the soul. Now that is very close to, well, that is at least a very good attempt of grasping uh, how a body works. He said, well, a body is perfectly shaped and this soul is embedded in every single part of this body, the physical parts of this body. This is how they work together, coming together. They create this whole which is greater than the sum of its parts. That's very good. But then he went even further and then said, well, 
sometimes this soul can leave the body, especially if it's especially the, the type of the soul which is uh, in the mind. And obviously there we, he, he goes towards this kind of idealist thoughts. And you see this in different places of his works where he starts from a materialist position and then in the last bit he, he's inconsistent, it doesn't follow through. But that's not really what, what Aristotle is about. Aristotle was about he didn't really care about it. He didn't really discuss that so much. It wasn't important for him whether what was the first unmoved mover or what, what this mind soul was and where it went and where it came from. He didn't talk about that. He talked about the body, the human body, the biology of, of animals uh, and the constant changing nature of nature uh, and, and try to unravel that and try to, for the first time, give a scientific exposition of, of all of these, trying to categorize different uh, entities and the way that they interact with each other. And that was the, uh, the strength of, uh, of, of Aristotle. Now, after Aristotle, uh, that he was the apex of Greek philosophy, although after him, many, many interesting Greek philosophers uh, uh, came about. But in general, the, uh, the, um, the, the tendencies went into a decline. And the main thing is, is this, because in spite of all the extremely profound ideas which came out of this movement and of this process, um, at the same time, the level of the means of production were not advanced enough to actually carry these things out, verify them in a proper way. What was needed was, first of all, hundreds of years of categorization of nature, of looking and dismembering, basically, looking at all the different aspects of nature uh, before, uh, 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 later on, people could start getting a grand overview again and taking, uh, and taking society and taking science uh, forward. Um, now, why is all of this important today? I would say that the, the main thing is that even though we've had all this development of science, but as I also tried to explain in the beginning, at the same time, we still live in a class society, which means that the ruling class is clinging more and more to idealist and obscure ideas tr to try to justify its rule. And we see the creeping in of idealist uh, ideas um, into every single field of science, of art, culture, uh, and politics, and knowledge of society. For us, philosophy is an extremely important thing not just to, because it's interesting, which it is, uh, but, but in order to understand how the world works and in order to, to change the world, basically. Um, and in fact, in Greek philosophy, I think what we can see is the potential of humanity. Because here we had a tiny taste of what we are capable of. In fact, these, uh, these philosophers, by power of uh, induction, basically, went far, far beyond the capabilities of their time. Now, today we have the development of science and technology and industry to an unheard level, which means that not only a tiny group of people can be freed up from labor uh, uh, to put their time to, to the use of development of science, technology, and philosophy, but we can free up the, well, all of humanity, in fact. The potential there exists for in a very short period of time in a socialist society to free up immense resources, which will mean that these ideas and these people we see today will be recreated on a far, far higher uh, uh, scale, uh, on a far, far higher level, that these, the, the, the process that we saw taking place in, uh, in, in, modern, in ancient Greece is only a taste of what we can actually achieve in a socialist society. Thank you very much. <laughs>